the red clover. So everyone identified themselves by the landscape, by the geographic features. The land was the Bible, it was the reference, and history was oral. It was not written. Um, that is one of the concepts of history that coming into the History Museum, I was able to sort of bring up to a little bit more modern era, that there is no longer prehistory in history. Some people think that history starts when writing starts. Native Americans here did not have a written culture. They had an oral culture. Everything was passed down orally. So that isn't to say they didn't have history. But in 1836, the first epidemic swept through Sebastopol. The first surveyor came through in 1805. Uh, Balboa sailed up the coast in the 1500s, and Drake came. But it wasn't until 1805 that the first surveyors arrived in Sonoma County, and 1805 was the first epidemics started happening in Marin. The epidemics were smallpox and measles, and they killed 90,000 people in Marin, Sonoma, and Napa counties within 10 years. From 1838 to 1846 in Sebastopol, 15 to 20 people died a day of these diseases. And in 1888, there was a big road construction at Highway 12 and Stony Point. And a journalist who happened to be visiting from Chicago and wrote in his journal about a huge carnage of bones that was unearthed during the road excavation that they just quietly covered back up. It was all the survivor, all the, the bones of all the Indians that they didn't have time to bury the way they had. Um, so it's still there, probably out where the dump is somewhere. But it was not written about in our local papers, but it was unearthed by some historian researching somebody else's journals in Chicago. But there was just, it was, a, it was a devastating loss for the native people because the first people to go were the elders and the babies. So in one, in 10 years, they lost all their history, all their knowledge, all the information, and the hope for the future. So you had a lost generation. And the white Euro-American settlers coming in, it was the end of the colonization of America. And so in 1820, 1840, Juan Carrillo came into Sebastopol and he had a piece of paper with fancy writing from the president of Mexico saying, this is all yours. And he suddenly had the authority with the backup of the Spanish missions to, sit, to start settling the land. And he built his first adobe structure basically right here where Safeway is, right around here by the high school. And it was in the middle of an Indian village. He just had no idea because they traveled so lightly on the land. They might have been off picking acorns somewhere or out at Badewa getting abalone. And so it wasn't evident that there were 7,000 people in a village all around this area because their houses were so um, simple. Totally reed houses, a few rocks, it's, and sometimes they even burned their houses down. If they got too full of fleas, they knew they could just go pick some tollies down in the Laguna and build another house. They did regularly. Everything they built came from a 50 to 100 mile radius. Everything they needed, all their food. And so it was a very interesting culture that so many people I hear about sustainability and the circle of can you get all your food from a 100 mile radius. And so there's a spiral coming back of knowledge that the Native Americans knew very well. The, so many of the interesting things I've learned in this crash course of history is about permaculture and how they practice permaculture gardening for thousands of years. And after a day like today, a good rain or that downpour we had a couple weeks ago, they would have done what was called a cold burn, which is where right after a rain, it gets a little hot and dry again. You burn out the underbrush, but there's no danger. You never burn on a Santa Ana day when it's hot and dry, but you wait till right after it rains. And then they would also practice coppicing, which is cutting down the willows close to the creeks so that they would spring back up again and hold the creek banks better and also provide the material fresh and new for their basket making every year. The homos are known as the most famous basket makers in all of North America. And one of the reasons they are such famous basket makers is that they had the stability of a culture for hundreds and hundreds of years, where they could go back to the same place every year and gather those materials. And I really appreciate 
the four-way test that you all have for the Rotary, it sounds a lot like Native American themes where you work for the greater good. You, every action you take is, is it going to help the whole society, not just myself? And your status in Native American culture, Californian Indian, was based on generosity. The more generous you were, the more you gave, the higher your status. The chief was required every season to basically give away all his possessions. And he'd have a big party in the potlatch and give it all away. And he knew that everyone would give them, give him back everything he needed. They'd give him their best basket or their best necklace or their best cuts of fish. So it was an ongoing um, give and take. And generosity really raised your status. And I really like that. So we have the first European American settlers coming in Sebastopol around 1850, 1840. And they just Lots of Native workers, except they were dying very quickly. And the Native Americans also realized that this wasn't such a good thing. So they started going north, up towards Fort Ross. And the Kashaya Pomo are still probably one of the most intact of the Pomo tribes, because they were left alone for the longest. The Russians weren't particularly interested in converting the Indians. They just wanted to get in, get their, what they wanted, and then they got out after 20 years. So statehood happens in 1850, and that was devastating for the native population here, that it also pretty much, um, the census in 1860 listed 22 Indians, or actually 1849, there was a survey done by um, Carrillo for Vallejo that listed 22 Indians in Sebastopol area out of what had been thousands. That was mostly the result of disease and voluntarily leaving. 1850s happens, <clears throat> the 1860s um, census lists 22 Indians or 25 Indians, all under the age of 25, and they're all listed as indentured servants. California's history, um, the first governor didn't particularly like Indians, and so the, the early laws allowed Indians to be indentured servants if you owned land. You, the Indians were pretty much yours to do with as you wished. If you shot them, that was okay. You would not be prosecuted. If they were indentured as your servants for the rest of their life, that was okay. And mostly it was children. And they took the 1860 census in Sebastopol has, although they're all under 25, and even one-year-olds are listed as indentured servants. Um, that law ended in 1863 after the Civil War. Um, but by 1857, recognizing that they really didn't want the Indians around here, that was the policy, that was the cultural norm, they moved them all up to Covalo and the reservation up there. So by the 1870s, there were no Indians listed on the 1870s Sebastopol census. And that was called the Death March to Covalo, and there's long stories about that, and it wasn't very pretty. But the Indians have endured, and they've survived, and what I found interesting when I started volunteering at the History Museum, I was researching for the cemetery walk, but I flipped upon an obituary from eight, 1901 for an Indian Joe Walker. And to have an obituary for an Indian at all at the turn of the century was pretty unusual. He was born in 1810 and had survived the epidemics and had lived on Walker Ranch his whole life. Walker Ranch is the property behind Palm Drive Hospital that now has the Laguna Uplands. It originally was 4,000 acres. Um, Joel Walker was the son of, or John Walker was one of our Sebastopol founding fathers. He owned the general store and his parents came over, some of the first settlers, into California. And his uncle was a Wild West man who had an Indian wife. And so the Walker family was a little bit more sympathetic to Indians. So he bought 4,000 acres from Juan Carrillo and had up to 500 Indians working his land. So at the time, seeing as how devastated they were by disease, I think of Walker Ranch as being sort of a refugee camp, in that he allowed the Indians to come and live in their ancestral territory and work the ranch. And this Indian Joe Walker, who was also known as Jose Ficero, um, he was the leader of this ragtag 
bunch of survivors who wandered in from different areas and were able to stay in Sebastopol. The last Indians camping in the Laguna were recorded after the Depression, during the Depression. And the Laguna was traditionally a camp, and if you look through the uh, newspaper clippings, you read about hobos and vagrants camping along the Laguna quite frequently, and those would have been Indians. So, coming up through modern history, there weren't that many Ind Indians here when the settlers came in. There was a lot of empty land, and there were remnants of it, um, mostly in rocks. And so you can see some of the earliest houses around Sebastopol. If you look at their foundation walls and the kinds of rocks that are in the foundation walls, a lot of them are probably the base rocks of the Indian villages because they would use rocks for their roundhouses and the foundations for their tule tops. So um, one of the things about doing the exhibit is how do you present tons of information and tons of stories and whittle it down into something that's manageable. And so we created a timeline that gives the hard history, but then I started working five years ago with the POMO Project, which is a group of artists and educators, and we've been putting on events to um, bring Indian culture into Sebastopol and share the history, but also share the modern, ongoing story of what it's like to grow up Indian in Sebastopol. Um, and so every year we have lots of events. I have some postcards over there. The lecture happening on, I think, October 26th is Molin Malake, and he's out of the Sonoma Indian Health Center, and he's going to be speaking about the boarding school years. After they took all the Indians to Covalo, the reservation, they started wandering back into Sebastopol. The first, but they weren't allowed to li really live here until after World War II. Um, they, they work on the farms and come and go and camp around, but you don't see any high school students at Annaly until 1945, after World War II. And then they became a little more normal. The families settled down, the Smiths and the Peets, and there's certain names that are still around in this area. But there aren't that many Indians living in Sebastopol anymore. There's lots in Santa Rosa. And when the Great Rancheria was established by the federal government in the 1920s, they took a whole bunch of what they called landless Indians who were just living in hovels around sort of where the fairgrounds is in Santa Rosa and offered them 15 acres out Occidental Road. And only three of them took up residence there. Um, and because of one little girl who was grew up there, Gloria Armstrong, she was able to hold on to one acre of land. The rest of it got sold off, nickel and dime when the Termination Act happened in 1957. That's when the federal government basically told most of the California tribes, we're not doing the tribal thing anymore. You're all Americans now. Assimilate. You no longer tribally own your land. It's individual property rights, and you can pay taxes. But to the Indians, this was a completely different way of operating. The elders really didn't understand it. These were Indians who were in their 80s and 90s, and they didn't you know, they were still practicing the old ways. And so most of them, the land just vanished. And the one acre that the Great Rancheria was able to hold on to legally allowed the tribe to refederate in the year 2000. And we know the story of what happened after that. So they've been building up their resources and they're re-educating their people. And all around California, Indians are re-educating themselves about their languages, about their culture, um, often they kind of don't necessarily like us white people coming in and telling their story for them. So in the exhibit, I use quotes from Indians whenever possible. Greg Service <clears throat> came in 2010 and gave a really outstanding lecture at the community center about the native history of the Laguna, and that's where I learned most of it. Um, and then I also was fortunate enough to record Vanna Lawson's last lecture in Sebastopol before she passed away. 2011, and she spoke about her mother, um, it, it was Essie Parrish, another great, the last kind of great Kashaya Pomo spiritual leader. And so I've been able to kind of put these together in the exhibit at the museum so you can listen to Vanna Lawson's um, speaking about gathering in the wild and how you can't take everything because you have to leave some for the squirrels and you have to leave some for the birds. And that idea of 
that the Indians concept that is that we take from the earth, we say please, we give back to the earth, and we say thank you. And that's a really basic concept that I, I sort of incorporating into my life and I, I really appreciate that all the service the Rotary does seems to me like it's it must have some basis in Native American um, culture because in America it's interesting how the what we call the European American settlers came in and we've been influenced by the land and we you know are it's the Indians lived here for thousands of years unchanged and pretty much when the settlers came in first things they did was start changing everything. They cut down all the oak trees on the Laguna de Santa Rosa and basically sold them for charcoal, burned them and sold them for charcoal to San Francisco and to fuel the gold rush. And that left the Indians without food. And But now the Laguna Foundation is busy planting the acorn oak trees as fast as they can and getting the native species back there. There were millions of beavers in California prior to the beef, the, mostly when the Russians were here, but the first settlers just killed all the beavers, and we changed our water ecology. California used to have year-round water, so Vassipal never irrigated anything. Luther Burbank never irrigated anything because the water table was about 200 feet higher than it is now, and that was there were three big lakes out here, up by Burnville Road, Lake Conneve, right off the high school, and then down by where Laguna Farms is. Three big lakes that all got dynamited. The first one was very early, that was black powder, because dynamite didn't come in until the Civil War. Um, but 1923 was when they blew up Lake Conneve to release the water and allow for more pasture and more farmland. It seemed like we had enough, but it changed the water and the way the system of the aquifer is. And I don't know if we can ever get that back, but if you look around, anybody who lives on land here has probably found evidence of arrowheads or um, stones. The Indians didn't start burying their dead until they became Christian during the Mission era. Prior to that, most of the California Indians here in this area cremated, so you wouldn't find bones, but if you come up across a big cache of stuff while you're plowing, probably was a grave site because they take all your stuff when you die and, and bury it. You, you didn't, nobody else had to bother with your stuff. Um, and everything they made. So I've gotten up through most of the history and um, some of the things that I brought in over on the table, this, this was an acorn economy. We live in the acorn belt and the women were primary processors of the acorns. And so I have a little acorn demonstration over there. I have big oak trees in my backyard. Since I've been learning about Indians, I figure I'd better try processing acorns. I mean, I know if they were pecans or macadamia nuts, I'd be out there getting every one of them. But I haven't quite figured out how to make them tasty yet. So maybe with bacon. I was really fortunate to find an arrowhead when I was raking my leaves last week in my backyard. The gophers kick stuff up out of the deep holes sometimes. And so it was right on my patio, and it wasn't there the day before. And I was breaking this little obsidian arrowhead showed up. So I thought that was kind of cool, because I live downtown Sebastopol um, by Zimfer Creek. And I know that you know, I thought, well, if they didn't live here, camp nearby, they surely hunted in my area. The landscape as it was here was very densely populated here and out of the coast. And in between, with the redwood forest, was the grizzly bear territory. Grizzly bear was a top predator here. Man was secondary to grizzly bear, and you had to know what, how to get through the forest. There were certain paths to get to the ocean, because they would go out there. Highway 12 was basically an Indian trail, and when the first settlers came in, it was 12 feet deep from, you know, on the grades where they were, but it was single file path, basically. And the Pomos were really renowned for being able to carry very heavy loads, very, very heavy loads of abalone shells and acorns or whatever they needed to go back and forth. Um, and Napa was the obsidian source. There's Annandale also had obsidian, but Napa was the main obsidian trade source. And the Indians had a um, sort of a royalty structure in terms of they knew to interbreed. Their, the languages kept people apart, and their social customs, their religion kept people, their population from getting too out of control. 
It was a densely populated corridor, but it was not overpopulated by any means. You had maybe 100,000 people between Cloverdale and Petaluma, which spread out isn't that many. And the, the religious societies and secret societies would have you abstain from meat for seven years or abstain from sex for seven years as part of the religious training. And people being people, that didn't always work, but it sort of control, it managed to control the population. And they also had a, a lot of herbal knowledge of plants. The average nine-year-old child could identify 300 plants and knew all their seasons and all their indication uses. Bio, um, biological knowledge was, you know, that was what you learned from the time you were born. So am I, should I be wrapping it up here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, well I brought in a few other small artifacts over there just to have a look at. There's a little piece of homo rock, a bigger piece of obsidian, which if you take off the little shard, you can see how sharp it was. That was their knife edge mostly. My treasure arrowhead. And then this is a clapper stick that's made out of elderberry. I made this from down at the Laguna. And I'm going to put this down for just a second. Good. Go Good nose, man. <laughs> nice this is their primary musical instrument. If any of you were down at the farmer's market on Sunday, you might have happened to see the Pomo dancers. And this is, and this is, I asked to the plant down behind the Laguna, the, the youth annex, I big dead stick sticking out, and I said, it's like elderberry. Is it okay if I take this home and pretend to be Indian in my backyard? <laughs> and this is what I got this, and I got an arrowhead. So I feel very fortunate to have learned the history of the land here and the respect I have for that society that was. It's not here anymore, but I think we can all learn something about how to behave in a good way. I think Rotary Club is very far on the way to behaving in a way that the ancestors here, who the Indians know, do not leave. The ancestors of all spiritual animals, plants, everything is still here. That's what they believe. Anyway, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. 
<laughs> Actually, David tried to give me a joke, and I listened, and I just, I didn't get it. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> but I got one, I got one. Um, an old married couple sitting on the couch watching TV. He's drinking a beer, and she's knitting. Um, oh, she's, uh, she's playing Angry Bird. But, um, and he's, he's sitting there, all of a sudden he just says, oh, the movie says, I love you. And she says, well, well where'd that come from? Was that you talking or was that the beer talking? And he says, oh, that was me talking to my beer. <laughs> Until you meet again.